Thanks, Dan, and thank you all for coming. It's my pleasure to have a chance to uh, share a little bit of this research with you. Um, I'm in the communication department here at UCLA, um, although my PhD is in math, and, um, so, and I'm a mathematical and computational modeler. Uh, so everything we're going to be seeing today is uh, theoretical modeling results, and we'll talk a little bit at the end, and I'm happy to get input on how to go about doing some empirical testing of this modeling work, which is sort of the next step in this research program. This is part of a big NIH project um, looking at collective problem solving from lots of different angles, and it's joint work with uh, postdoc John Lang, who's supported by that grant. So this question about exploration versus exploitation is one that spans many different domains and whatever domain you're from, there's probably some version of this trade-off that exists in, or at least one version, if not multiple versions in the literature where if you're home discipline. The first computational model that I ever published was about bluegill fish um, searching for habitat, basically. This is uh, from that paper, and this was um, the, like, I, I've gotten much better at graphics since, since then, but um, this was a representation of our pond, and these were little patches of food, and there were also temperature gradients in there, and we had this individual-based model trying to look at how different rules that govern sort of the internal process of how a fish might search or, or identify habitat um, to uh, eat and swim around in um, would make different predictions about distributions of food populations, of fish populations. And one of the things that happens in this sort of calculus for a fish or any species in a foraging model is that when they're in a place, um, if there's sort of some level of food there and some kind of temperature gradient, you know, especially for fish, um, Essentially, evolutionarily speaking, like a fish wants to maximize its growth because growth translates to fecundity, which means how many eggs they have, which means how many babies they have, which means sort of you know, how much they, they, they pass on. So they want to maximize their, their bioenergetic potential by getting the most food at the right optimal temperature. Well, if they're in a place and it has a certain amount of food, right, they have this decision of whether or not they want to sort of stay where they know and say exploit the, the food that's there or give up on the patch that they're at and sort of explore to look and see if there's a better patch out there. Right? And so that's this trade-off. Can I exploit what I have now and, and, and take just sort of maximize the, the potential of the solution that I already know? Or should I go out and explore and look for other solutions that might potentially be better? So in other disciplines, um, <clears throat> just in evolution in general, right? this is sort of the trade-off between mutation and selection. Mutation explores the potential space of genotypes and on down the road phenotypes, right? And selection refines and focuses in on those that we've already found, the solutions that we already know. Um, in engineering, this is the trade-off between research and development. So you could, if you're a firm, you can allocate resources towards research and development to search for other products or other solutions to making more money. Or you can take the ones that you've got and focus on process innovation, which means making whatever you have faster and cheaper and more efficiently. Um, in organizations, uh, one of the first papers that I know of that like, really called this exploration and exploitation was by a guy named uh, James March in organizational theory. And he talks about this trade-off between slow and fast learners. So if you're an organization, you can bring people into your organization and you have a choice, essentially, as to how fast you indoctrinate them with the culture and code of your organization or you can give them time and sort of learn from them first. So slow learners are people that hold on to the information and ways of doing things that they bring with them to the table, which could potentially allow you to explore new ways of doing things. Fast learners quickly learn to exploit the knowledge that's already encoded in the organization, um, so you don't get the benefits of their, the, knowledge that they, the new knowledge that they bring, but they're very quickly up to speed with the stuff that you already have. And in economics, this isn't really a real problem. Are there any economists in here? Okay, so they can be sort of like, the, it's good to have a whipping boy discipline um, in a talk. So the economists, right, this isn't like a real problem, but it's a, it's a pretend made up problem. They call the multi-armed bandit problem. So the multi-armed bandit is like a row of slot machines. 
those are the arms, the multi-arms. You've got a lot of arms. And so a person has a choice. If I'm pulling a slot machine and I'm getting a certain payoff, I can say, well, this is a pretty good payoff. I'm going to just keep pulling that arm. Or I can say, you know, maybe I can waste some of my quarters and go pull a different arm and explore and see to, to try to figure out if this other slot machine has a higher average payoff. And so there's equations for when you should switch and so on and so forth. But it's like in general kind of a hard problem. OK, so and so overall, right, there, there, we face this trade-off between exploiting a solution that we have already, but with the potential downside that this might not be sort of a global optimum, right? It could be sort of a local optimum, and there might be better things out there. Or we could go explore for other solutions, but then we sort of let go of this current place that we're at, and potentially we might be exploring forever. Maybe we were at the best thing uh, already. So I'm going to look at this trade-off in the context of group problem solving. And the way that I'm going to think about that is if I have different members of a team, I can sort of exploit the knowledge of my fellow team members. I can say, hey, you know what? Um, Dan, the work that he's doing is way cooler than mine. He seems to be getting lots of good publications and everything. I can just go do what he's doing. Or instead, I could try to like go on my own and sort of find my own solutions, write my own type of papers, do my own type of thing. Right? So that's if I'm working in a group of problem solvers, we can, we can just sort of copy and work with the best person stuff where we can use our own individual um, directions and then at the end sort of compare notes and see who did the best. And I'm going to examine this in a really simple version of this where I imagine that I have sort of just two problem solvers, okay? And they can work in what we call in sequence or in parallel. So to work in sequence means that the first problem solver sort of goes and looks for the best solution they can find. And when they sort of get stuck, they hand that solution over to the second problem solver who starts where they left off and goes from there and finds the best solution they can find. That's in sequence problem solving. In parallel means we both start off, we go find our best solution, and at the end, we compare notes and take the maximum of those two. So that's, that's all this means. Everybody feel good about this trade-off? Okay, so we can think of this in lots of different contexts. This is sponsored by the NIH, so we can think of medical contexts where this might happen. Imagine if you have a patient that comes into the hospital, right? One doctor interviews them, they run different tests, they come up with a diagnosis, they can call in another doctor, and they can say, this is what I think this patient has, this is what I've done, here's where I'm at, what do you think? And then that doctor can go from there, right? Or you can call in a second doctor, and that doctor can just start off fresh, run their own tests, at the patient their own questions, come up with their own diagnosis, and then we can compare notes at the end. If we're thinking about uh, the NIH allocating research money to trying to solve some kind of difficult public health problem, right, they can just field a bunch of independent teams, like give grants to a whole bunch of people independently and say, go, what's your solution, what's your solution, what's your solution? Or we can sort of do it in sequence where one team comes up with a solution and we sort of hand that off, this is the state of our knowledge to the next team and so on and so forth. Or um, right now there's a lot of interest in this area of what they call open innovation or crowd problem solving. So an example of this is this platform called Top Coder where people basically compete to write computer code for companies or whatever you want. Um, anybody can hire people to do this. And so um, when a company does this, they often break up their problem into many small chunks. And you could imagine doing this in different ways. You could try to have a bunch of different teams compete and come up with the best solution to your problem and then just take the best out of all those. Or again, you can take a part piece of code and hand it to another team and then that code and hand it to another team and so forth. And I said that this is just for two problem solvers, but just by induction, this extends to n problem solvers. So anything we say, we'll just talk about two. OK, so that's our context. How are we going to model problem solving? So we're going to model this in just like a really totally standard way. Typically in the literature, in economics and organizations, and wherever else people have done this, we usually model problem solving as a search for the highest, like, quote, fitness solution. Right? Some economists call this payoff. It's supposed to be an evolutionary talk, so we'll call it fitness, right? So um, the idea is that there's some space of solutions. In this case, it's a two-dimensional space. So there's 
every possible solution to our problem is described by these two variables, the kind of horizontal variables here. And then the vertical axis is the fitness of each one of those solutions, right? And problem solvers, you can think of them as having like a location in this space. That's like the current solution that they're working on. And typically they only have like local knowledge of the space, right? If we knew the whole space and we knew the fitness or goodness of all the solutions, we would just like go right here because this is the best solution out there. But we think of it as that, you know, we don't know all the possible solutions and how good they are. We are sort of currently working on one possible solution and we sort of know how good it is. And then we can sort of move through this space searching, trying to find this, this global optimum. And this is just a cross section of that same space. And usually the way people model search is that it's just called like a gradient search. So wherever you're at, you just move in the direction that uh, has the highest gradient, that increases the fastest. And of course what happens is that then people get stuck on these little local optima. Okay, so if I'm here, I move along, and then I get stuck here and I say, okay, this is my best possible solution, and I may not make it over to there. And of course, there's, there's variations on these rules. Maybe I can make errors, which can allow me to get out of these things, and so on and so forth. So, all right, that's our basic model. How are we going to model collaboration if we have more than one problem solver? Okay. So, sometimes the way that this has been modeled is exactly like this, except now you've got lots of people on this space. They're all moving around finding global optima. And as they go, they sort of like, they, maybe they live in a social network or something. They communicate to one another. They say, hey, you know, um, I'm over here and my solution's better than yours. And so I say, wow, that's, that's good. I'm going to copy you and move to where you are. And eventually, uh, everybody gets to the same space. They all end up on some local optimum, maybe the global optimum, maybe not. And that's the group's problem. That's the group's solution. The kind of a critique of that way of modeling collective problem solving is that if you think about it for a second, the group in that model never does any better than the best person in the group. Right? All they're doing is just sort of copying each other. Potentially, they copy each other too early and they actually do worse than the best person would have done on their own. But the best they could possibly do is if they sort of just all went to, their, to, the, to the highest point they could find and then copied at the end. That's, does that make sense? So that doesn't seem to fit with reality, right? Because there's all this literature about the wisdom of crowds and collective intelligence and so forth that says that, and we also have personal experience, right? That somehow, usually when we work together with somebody else, it's, we do better than just we do as individuals, right? Otherwise. Like, there would be no reason for, like, the, the really good scholars to collaborate with anybody else, right? They would just be bringing me down, right, or, or, or you down, or whoever. So, so um, how to, to, in order to incorporate some kind of, like, synergistic effects between problem solvers, we need to introduce some diversity, that different problem solvers somehow bring different things to the table. And the way we're going to do that is using an idea that was... I mean, the, the modeling idea was um, suggested by Lu Hong and, and Scott Page, which is that we're going to give different problem solvers what we call different perspectives. Okay? And so I'm going to walk through an example of this um, and then kind of make it more formal. So here's our example. Suppose that this is my wife, Georgia, and that's me. I didn't realize how kind of drugged out I look <laughs> when I put this photo here. but. Um, uh, so, <laughs> the, <laughs> I'm tired a lot of, I don't sleep enough. So, um, let, imagine that we're searching for a house in LA, okay? There's lots and lots of houses out there in LA. We, and let's for the moment imagine that um, my wife and I, first of all, can totally agree on uh, how good a house is. Like, we have the same preferences. This is not true, but let's just suppose that it is for a second. And that we could then... If we go and see a house, we can actually tell how good it is. We can assign it a fitness, right, if we go look at it. Okay? But there's so many houses out there that we can't possibly go look at every single house. Right? So we have to have some way to search among them. Now, every house is described by many, many, many different variables. Like even if on a website like Zillow, there's something like 30 or this isn't even all the variables. There's like 30 or 40 variables that can describe every given house. 
how long it's been on the market, how many bathrooms, how many bedrooms, how many square footage, what the lot sizes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? And there's more real variables than that, like what wood is the floor made out of, and so on and so forth. And we can imagine that all those variables go into determining how good this house is. But we can't, of course, in our head, think about all those variables all the time. We don't even have access to information on all those variables. So what we're going to do is we are each going to sort of have certain variables that we focus in on, and those are the variables that guide our search. And that's what we call our perspective. Okay? So to make this overly simple, I'm going to imagine that each one of us is really computationally simplistic, and we only look at a single variable to help guide our search, just, just for illustration purposes. Okay. So let's imagine here are all the houses that right now they're just randomly arranged along this horizontal axis, but they all have some different fitness, which we don't know yet. There's one house that we decide is sort of our starting point. We're going to go look at this house and we know how good it is, but we don't know how good the rest are. So Georgia is going to use the perspective square footage to organize her search. So we can line up all these houses from the smallest to the largest. This is the house that we know about. She still doesn't know about the fitness of all these other houses, but if she uses this gradient search, what she's going to do is going to, she sort of thinks of these two houses as the most similar to the house that she's at right now. These are the solutions that are kind of adjacent. This is where the adjacent possible in, in evolution, right? These are the things that you can get to from where you're at now. So she says, okay, I'm going to go test, go look at these two houses. She finds that this one is better, so she now looks at the houses that are closest to that. She looks at this house. It's, it's better. Then she goes and looks at this house. It's getting worse. And so she says, okay, this house is the best one according to my search heuristic. So I'm going to stop, stop there. Oop. Okay, so that's her solution to the problem. Now, let's imagine that I have a different perspective. So for me, which houses are sort of most similar to this are different. Maybe I use distance from work. So now if I rearrange these houses according to distance from work, right, their fitness hasn't changed because their, their fitness is determined by all these other variables out there, including distance from work. But which houses are most similar to this house we're starting at are now different. So I'm going to test these houses and, and eventually converge to, to this local optimum. And that's going to be the house that I say, no, I think this is sort of the best solution I could come up with with my way of searching. So, if we're searching in parallel, now I say, okay, I, this is the best house I could come up with. She says, this is the best house I could come up with. And, you know, we go with hers, right? Because hers is better than mine. Everybody got it? Okay. So, <clears throat> on the other hand, if we went in sequence, right, let's imagine that first we use my perspective and then hers. So, again, we start here. I get to this house. Now, she takes over, starting here, using her square footage perspective. If she starts here instead of here, now she's going to actually converge to this optimal solution, right? And we'll end up with the best solution if, we, if I went first and then said, why don't you start looking at this house and so on. Feel it? You're feeling good? Okay. So, all right. So, that's the difference here in this example between in sequence and um, in parallel. This was the solution we ended up with in parallel. That was our in-sequence solution, in, at least in this order. And in this example, in-sequence did better. Okay. So we're going to now um, try to model this more, more broadly. This was just like a, one example. And the way we're going to represent perspectives um, overall is not, so in this example, let me say this again. In this example, for every given solution, there's only sort of two solutions that are, that are nearby it, right, that we can test. But in general, like if we think about some problem like a diagnosis for a patient or a set of computer code, you know, um, if I'm at sort of, I'm thinking like, well, this person seems like they, they came in with a stomach problem, like it could be a number of things. This is my sort of current best guess. But I'm not sort of restricted to sort of just two other things that I'm willing to, to, to consider, right? There might be four or five or ten other things that I would be willing to go to next from where I'm at, okay? And so to represent these more broadly, these perspectives, we're going to think of them as a network over all possible solutions. Okay, so, so these are all of the houses, 
And this network could represent one person's perspective. So if I'm at you know, this pink house, then all of these adjacent houses, all these house, neighboring houses, are the ones that I consider most similar to this. And those are the ones I would check next. And I would move to the best of those. And then I would check all the neighbors of that house, and so on. This part is new, right? Um, this network perspective is, is new from our work. So that's how we're going to model this. And I'll just do one more example so that we're definitely all on the same page. Imagine these are all my solutions, and these numbers are their, their fitness. Okay. Um, so this could be one person's perspective network, this green network. And I'm going to imagine I start at this worst possible solution, number one. So for this person, they would check all their neighbors, 75, 47, 46, and 88. And say, OK, 88 is the best adjacent solution. I move there. They check the neighbors of that solution. There are no better neighbors. So this is the best solution they come up with from that perspective. Here's another person's network. They start here. They check the neighbors. 80 turns out to be the highest neighbor. Then they move to 95. That's a, a local optimum for them. And so their best solution is 95. Um, if they worked in parallel, let's say that the pink person goes first, right? So they get to 95. Now if the green person goes next, 99 is a neighbor of that for them. And so we end up at the global optimum if they go in sequence for this example. So that's how we're going to do this. And the rest of the talk is going to go like this. I'm going to define a particular class of problems for which I can prove analytically that one of these two heuristics works better in expectation always, no, in expectation. And then we're going to look at how we can sort of break the assumptions of that theorem to, to get the other result. So, the class of problems that we're going to look at for this theorem are what we call unstructured problems. And here's the definition of this. So a problem is unstructured if every individual's perspective network is a random network over solutions. So in other words, the, the simplest version of this is that any two possible solutions are connected with uh, just some probability p. So for every pair of solutions, you just flip a coin, and you connect them if it, if it comes up heads, and you don't if it comes up tails. This is like, there's, actu there's actually sort of a more general model. These Chung Lu random networks are exactly like that, except we also allow for um, different solutions to have different average degrees, different average number of connections. So that's all, if you're into network stuff. But you can just think of it as a completely random network. And uh, in particular, the, network is, the networks are independent of one another, and they're independent of payoffs. So solutions are not more or less likely to be connected or have higher or lower degrees, um, depending on their payoffs. Right? It's all just independent of one another. So that's what we mean by a problem being unstructured. The way to, so you can think about, we think about this as being like a problem that is either sort of hard or a problem that we don't understand very well. The reason why we think of that is because, you know, what does it mean for two solutions to be connected? That means like I think of solution A as similar to solution B, but the fact that those two solutions are connected or similar to one another really is independent of how good the solutions are. Like the solutions that I think of as similar to one another, that doesn't really tell me that much about how they, they, don't, they don't have similar fitness, okay, necessarily. They, they may or they may not, but it's kind of independent of that, which means that really the heuristics that we're using are not really very informative heuristics for this problem. This is like a problem that, yeah, we just haven't totally figured out very well yet, right? And you can imagine this. Like, I mean, if I'm a drug company trying to figure out a, a drug to, to, to fight some new disease, right, and I can imagine there's this sort of how much of all these different chemical compounds I could put into the drug, right? And I just don't really know if I add a little more of this or add a little more of that, like, Maybe it'll totally work. Maybe it'll kill the person. Like, I don't know. Right. So um, that's an unstructured problem. Mathematically, what's really key about this is that for every solution, the, the expected distribution of payoffs of the neighbors is the same, right? regardless of where you're at. So kind of like how good your neighbors are looks, looks the same. So 
I will say, so we, we started working on this question, and the postdoc really, John um, did the, the lion's work on the proof of this theorem. And when he first told me, I said, I thought he has got to be wrong. Like, this just can't be right. Um, because it's totally not what I thought was the answer. Like, my intuition is that in sequence, problem solving should just like almost always be better. Right? Because in sequence allows you to exploit how good the other person did before you. I mean, you can think of it as there being, um, you know, one person goes first, and now the second person has an option of either starting at this really good place or just starting over at the beginning. Right? And so why wouldn't you want to start at a good place? I mean, it seems like you can only go up. I mean, you can only go up, literally. Uh, we, the rule of the model is you can only go up. So if you start where they start, at the very worst, you do as good as they did, right? And hopefully you are connected to some point that's better than theirs, so you should go up. So I would have thought in sequence should be better, but it turns out I was, I, I was wrong. Um, and for these unstructured problems, the, the theorem is for problems that are unstructured like this, the expected payoff from searching in parallel is always greater than or equal to the expected payoff from searching in sequence. And I'll give some intuition for this in a second. But basically what we're saying is that for these hard problems, if you don't really know what's going on, then you should not follow where the other person started. Right? You should start off on your own. If you're the NIH, you should field independent teams. Um, another example where we, we've seen this actually happen in real life is NASA. When NASA has a crisis, when something goes wrong in space, what they do is they make a whole bunch of independent teams like immediately and they just have them go work completely independently and then they come back and report and take the best solution. Now there's also a time crunch thing that's happening there, but um, what, what they don't do is like have the teams collaborate with one another. They just go complete, complete independence, which is not what they do for problems that they really understand, right? Like when they're trying to design the space shuttle from in, initially, right? They don't just design 20 space shuttles and then say which one's the best. Okay, so, um, and not, the, our theorem is a little bit nicer than just giving this expected result. We can actually derive exactly the expected difference between these two. So just to show a graph like, so here's, this, this, is, the, this is the expected advantage of in parallel search. And this black line is from our, our theoretical model. And these blue dots are from a bunch of simulations where we actually ran agents doing this a bunch of times. And all, the only thing, the horizontal axis is varying how good of a solution they start at. So the solutions range from fitness of zero to one. And, you know, our theory matches up with our simulations, which is good. And it also illustrates that, like, this inequality really only becomes equality when they already start at, like, the best possible solution. Like, if you're at the maximum, then it doesn't make any difference which one you do. But otherwise, it's actually strictly better to, to search in parallel. Okay. So here's, here was the intuition that it took me a while to understand, which is that, so imagine that this first agent goes and they get to their current best solution. And now the second agent has an option to start there or start over at the beginning. The reason why they should start at the beginning for these unstructured problems is that if they start at this sort of like already good solution, because that solution is sort of already hot, pretty high, there's a better chance that it is a local optimum for this person too. Even though they have this other perspective, like this is a good solution, and there just are not that many other solutions that are higher than that. And so there's a lower probability that they have a path to one of those higher solutions. But if they start off down here, they've got lots more paths available to them and so there's a better chance that they're sort of in a basin of attraction for one of these other local optima that's actually higher than this one. I have like in my mind this vision and I tried to make a slide of this of like, uh, like you're up on top of a mountain and like there's clouds and you can only see the other peaks that are like peaking up above the clouds, right? And so if you're up on this high mountain, there are some other solutions out there that are better than you, but there's no way to get to them without sort of going back down and coming back up again, right? You can only sort of the only connections that matter to you are connections that go to higher solutions because we don't sort of allow agents to search worse things. Okay, so that's our intuition. And now we're gonna understand 
Okay, so this is true in this case of unstructured problems, but what happens if we break the assumptions of an unstructured problem? Can we get situations where in sequence is actually better? So the first thing is, our, m this explanation about the intuition is that high solutions actually don't have that many neighbors that are good solutions. So one way to break this, break this is to make good solutions have more neighbors. If good solutions have higher degree networks, then it turns out that in sequence tends to be better. And we can do this by, um, this, this is just a, some parameter, epsilon, that somehow controls the correlation between the fitness of a solution and its number of connections. So as epsilon goes up, this correlation goes up. That's what this graph is showing. And what we see here again is the advantage of in parallel search. So we see that when the correlation is low, like in the independent case, in parallel does better. But as that correlation ramps up, eventually we get down here to negative numbers, which means that in sequence is doing better. So this is a way sort of in theory to break this. But in practice, this to me seems probably unlikely to be true. Right? What this would mean is that really good solutions, if we're at a good, uh, like if we have a great design for a product, it means that we can sort of think of lots of other designs that are close to it. But if we have a poor design, we can only think of like two or three designs, right? Or if we have like a diagnosis for a patient that's like really good, it's almost exactly perfectly what they have, we can think of tons of other close by diagnoses. It's probably not the case, right? I sort of think of it as you, the better you get, the fewer paths, the fewer degrees of freedom you have typically. So this is, doesn't fit with my intuition of how the real world works, but if, in theory, it can break this theorem. But there are other ways of, of breaking our assumptions. So another way that it sort of makes more sense to me is that um, agents could sort of be specialized. So there could be, like, you could have a high, if I lay out all the solutions, you could have a high density network for some of them, and I have a high density network for others. And so we're sort of have this specialization. Like, there's types of solutions where I sort of know everything that's going on and all the adjacencies among them, and you know everything that's going on over here. In that case, then it can be the c possible that in sequence does better, right? If we have these different domain areas. So in other words, like, if you tell me about a solution um, like that really uses a bunch of anthropology terminology, right? I'm just like, well, that sounds good to me, but I have no idea where to go from there, right? I don't know. I, I have no adjacent solutions to that. And then I tell you, like, you know, you use this using the you know, cohomology group, blah, 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 some kind of math stuff, you might be like, okay, great, you know, and have no adjacent possible. And then the last example of breaking this that I'm going to give is where, um, so right now, we have all these solutions and they're connected by these, these random networks, but what if we, if we go back to my, like, original examples, all of our solutions were always, like, embedded in this space, right, like, our solution spaces look like actual physical spaces, not just networks over points. So let's imagine that we go back to this spatial model, but now we start connecting points with a, with a network over this landscape. And that network tells me sort of where I can hop from place to place. So if we do that, and so first of all, um, places are more likely to be connected if they're closer to each other in this physical space or you know, solution space, then it's true that um, for really rough spaces, the in parallel search is better. And for smoother spaces where there's fewer local optima, then in sequence is better. And this is where this captures our intuition that like, it's sort of difficult problems, problems where there's lots of local optima, lots of places you can get stuck. That's when you want to search in parallel. And for problems that are sort of easier, where we sort of know what to do, and if we keep going up, we'll eventually get to better and better solutions, and we're not that likely to get stuck along the way. That's where it's better for you to go and then for me to pick up where you left off. And we have simulations to confirm this. Like, these graphs are just different. Um, so the NK space, some of you might know from, like, this is a nice uh, formal it was developed to model evolution. Um, 
So these are a set of spaces where they go from sort of less rough to more rough. And what we see is that when they're really rough, in parallel does better. When they're really smooth, in sequence does better. And this is another family of spaces um, where we sort of, as we rough them up, again, um, in parallel does better. So I'm going to conclude with just one sort of anecdote um, that I was surprised actually supported what we found because um, I rig my memory of this example. I, I talk about this example in my classes a lot, but I'd always thought that it went slightly different. And when I went back, because I thought, oh man, that contradicts our theorem, I went back and it turned out, oh great, actually it doesn't. So, so um, has anybody seen this before? OK, good. So um, you probably know better than I do, many of you, about proteins. So proteins are you know, chemicals in our body. And roughly, like their shape determines um, what they do, their function. And they go through this process called folding, where they reconfigure themselves into different shapes, which determine that they can you know, do different things. And my you know, fourth grade biology understanding is that like a bunch of diseases happen because proteins misfold into the wrong shapes. So like crossfield jacobs disease, and maybe people think sometimes Alzheimer's, and all kinds of things. What's kind of going wrong is that your proteins misfold, and they can't do what they're supposed to do, and then stuff gets messed up. So it's a really important medical problem to understand how proteins fold from one configuration into another. And they sort of try to do it because they're governed by laws of physics, they have to do this in kind of like a minimal energy way. Okay? So there are big, huge supercomputers running like 24-7, 365, trying to optimize these protein folding problems, right? Just cranking, 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 trying to solve these problems. But the, prob the issue is, is that there's so many degrees of freedom in this protein folding that it's a really hard problem. I mean, it's just computationally difficult to maximize these things and find the solutions. So these, these people came up with this idea. It's actually followed after, um, do you guys remember SETI at home? The search for extraterrestrial intelligence, right? Okay, now so people all had these like screen savers that were like searching for aliens. So that was also a hard computational problem, right, to search through all the radio telescope data. And so originally their idea was, okay, instead of searching for aliens, let's make a screen saver that searches for proteins folding solutions and that'll be more useful than, than finding, finding Aliens, possibly. And then they said, OK, you know what? Um, you know, desktops sitting around doing nothing is not the only sort of wasted computational power out there that we have that we could use, sort of excess capacity. There's also like a bunch of people's brains that are essentially doing like the equivalent of being a screensaver a lot of the time, like playing Minesweeper or Solitaire or whatever. And so instead of having them do that, um, maybe we could have them like actually solving some useful problem. So they made up this game called Fold It, which you can download and, um, and go play. And it's kind of, you know, it's supposed to be actually fun. They, they describe it as like a combination of like Tetris and a Rubik's Cube or something. And, um, and as, this is a video of somebody playing it. You can see they're like dragging these things around and they get little points and they, um, but what they're really doing is solving like a real protein folding problem. So they released this game. And when they did this, they thought like, okay, this is just going to be like more computers, except they'll probably be worse because they're not really like computers. They're people. And the computers were like programmed to do this really, really well. But it turned out that something happened that was very surprising to them, which is it turned out actually like people were super good at this in a way. Like they actually solved all these problems that they could never solve before <laughs> as soon as they released it to all these gamers. All right, so for an example, this is, this is from Scientific American. They solved this, this enzyme problem in three weeks. And like they said, this is a problem that had been stumping scientists for a decade. Right? They had like, like these big computers like cranking away on this for like 10 years. And they give it to the gamers like three weeks later. They have a solution that once they, the, the gamers don't totally solve it, but they get far enough along that once they hand it to the computer, the computer can just like finish it off. Right? So this was kind of amazing. And they went to try to figure out like, Wow, how is this? And the, the key thing is that like, people are different from one another, effectively, is the driver of all the benefits of this. So um, these complicated graphs here are showing um, each 
row here is a different player and the columns are two different problems and the colors correspond to like the different kinds of moves that the players use. And then the concentric circles, the inside is the first hour that they played that puzzle, the middle is the first day and the outside is the um, entire time that they worked on that puzzle. So you can think of these colors as giving kind of a, a strategy that the player is using. You know, the distribution of colors is the strategy that the player uses. And what you can see is that first of all, you know, within a puzzle, different players are different. Like this person did a whole bunch of purple and red. This person did like almost no red. So we've got diversity across players. Within a player, players change over time. You know, they may start doing one thing and then like here they do a lot more red after a while. And then they use different strategies on different puzzles as well, right? And now this is like, this is the computer algorithm, which of course like does the same thing all day every day. Like it just only has one algorithm and so that's what it does and every computer does the same thing. They have this kind of quote that unlike the computational approaches, the people, the gamers exploit, or explore not only the conformational space, that is the space of um, solutions, but also the space of search strategies, right? So there's different search strategies available. So they had this idea, which was, um, why don't we like at any given time take the very best solution out there and, and, and let people start there, right? So out of a, a whole system, we'll take the best possible solution right now and then just like publish, kind of publish isn't the right word, but like make it available. You can, you can always start at the best possible solution and go from there which is like in sequence problem solving, right? And they call this the all hands solution, okay? So they had this, they, they ran this test. They had a bunch of puzzles that were set up this way. The top solutions at any given time were made available where anybody could download and open them, right? But then what surprisingly to them, what they found was that typically this caused the players to converge more quickly to regions of the confirmation space rather than explore the space fully. In fact, like they, they didn't solve puzzles this way. It was much better for them to like let a whole bunch of people work independently than it was to like hand off these best solutions. And so in fact, like this kind of in parallel searching for this extremely difficult problem that has lots and lots of local optima in parallel really did work better than in sequence, which is what our theorem said. So we feel like we can go home. We're not done yet. So that's the end of um, really what I wanted to, to talk about. What we're, where we're going next, hopefully, I mean, is to, um, you know, try and test this model a little bit more. So we're, we have some ideas for doing this, like with computer programming and letting people, you know, try to solve computer programming challenges and then build off one another and so forth. But um, nothing is set in stone yet, so I'm open to, to any suggestions. Thanks for your attention. in some sense, are um, in parallel. And that sort of follows Darwinian randomized, random mutation, something's going to work eventually. Um, but some of those grand challenges get refined over time. And certainly everyone has information about, you know, the best, the, the strategies of the best autonomous car last cycle that then can be used in the next cycle. So it seems that both seem to be working and as you said, as you get a better defined problem, that, that in, some case, in, some sense, in some sense that's a test case for your model, the better defined problems probably work better in parallel. But, but they still bring in that, that, that Darwinian process. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And one of the things that's like, I think misleading about the way that we have termed this is that we describe it as an unstructured problem, but it's really not the problem that's I mean, the problem is sort of currently unstructured in our mind. In a sense, like, we see it as unstructured right now because we haven't figured out a better network for viewing it better. And so I think what, in your example, what you're saying is that, like, we sort of start out unstructured, and so it's good to go in parallel. But over time, we actually sort of not only find better solutions, but we get better perspectives. And so maybe later, it is better to do in sequence. Yeah. It's got to, it's got to tie back to the errors of the magnitude of potential errors. You know, as you define something better and better, the magnitude of potential errors in some sense is less, and therefore, maybe that's the intuition. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's right. Yeah? Um, so one question, when, when you were trying to kind of break your assumptions, 
I guess when it's completely random, the order might not matter, but maybe once people get different enough, the order of who is in sequence after whom could start mattering. Like in the in every example you showed us, if the if the green had gone to the other way, the order was opposite, they would still get stuck on 88. So yes. I guess is that something that you were... Yeah, so we just, I mean, the theorem is really just saying, like, in expectation, if we go in sequence, um, I have to think back if like we, I don't think it matters, it doesn't matter if we like test both ways. Um, but it's true that, um, I, I mean, I think the case like when if the, the distribution is very skewed, right? So you have some individuals that are really, really good. And so once it reaches them, they might be able to find the solution really quick. And so if they're early on, things might happen faster. If they're later on, things might happen Slower, if you get stuck with someone who's kind of, you know, the um, one else's, you'll be stuck at the lower. So, kind of, how, how skewed does the distribution, or how unskewed does it need to be for the order not to matter? Or maybe once you have, you know, it's kind of. Yeah. yeah, so that's a good, that's a great question. So, one thing that is, two, two things about that. So, um, I didn't talk too much about how these, like the broad general, definition of these random networks. But it actually turns out that it is, the theorem still holds even if um, like one person is way better than the other person. Like even if, so let's say I have two people, one person has just sort of like a really sparse network and the other person has this totally dense network, which means that like they can, right? Um, even in that case, this, this is still, it's still true that you would rather go in parallel than in sequence, like regardless of the order. But um, something that I hadn't thought about, so I said this just like, which your question made me think about was like, I said this extends to like n people if we um, go by induction. But that, I might be assuming that I have a pre-specified order because if I have n people and I don't have a pre-specified order, then right, n ordered things can be a lot more things, basically, right? So if I have lots of orderings, but n people in parallel, it's still just only one, one possible set of things in parallel. So it, it might be that the kind of combinatorics of like, I have a thousand people in sequence, that's actually like many, many combinations. So that's, it, that's something cool to think about. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for this talk. It's really interesting. Um, so I was wondering about one of your conclusions about the roughness of the uh, fitness landscape uh, that determines which strategy is the best to use. So I was wondering whether the roughness of this landscape um, depends on the number of variables that are in, that determine the fitness and the relatedness of these variables. Um, so. I would say that kind of, so for one thing, this is, this part of like, we could sort of assume that it's anything, we could make any surface we wanted to. So you could have a surface with few variables that was extremely rough, or a surface with many variables that was extremely smooth, or any combination in between. Like we, there's no kind of limit on those, those two things don't have to be related to one another. Um, The, it is the case though that sort of like the more variables are, that are out there, the higher likelihood it is that there is some combination of variables that give you a smooth version. Um, which is to say that like there, so a smooth version makes it easier, right? And so the more variables there are, the more likely it is that somebody out there has a perspective for which this problem is sort of relatively easy for them. Um, and that's that's one of the reasons, if in the like wisdom of crowd stuff, like why um, having like diverse groups really helps because the more diverse groups there are, the more heuristics you have, perspectives you have available to you, and the more likely it, it is that somewhere in that set of perspectives there's somebody for whom the problem like sort of, or or some subset of people for who can combine their heuristics together to get something that actually makes it easy. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, just sort of 
building on Renee's question, um, well, first, thank you. This is super interesting. Um, but building on that question, so just thinking about sort of the house selection paradigm, um, you know, assuming that the different variables that are involved in evaluating a house are varying independently, then I guess I just wanted to push you a little bit on the psychological plausibility of having a perspective but not also simultaneously wanting to, like being willing to not maximize that as, you know, because if the, if the way that the selection is working is, you know, in sequence, first person finds a maximum and then that's the point from which the second player then maximizes theirs, if they're varying independently, that could readily, you know, drop the fitness of the initial choice down to zero. And so I guess, so, you know, if the, fir if the first person's perspective is floor space and then the second person's perspective is lot space, um, if they're varying independently, then maximization of one does not necessarily correlate with maximization of the other one, even if the first choice puts you in a position to maximize the second one at the cost of the first. So, you know, in the way you structure the model, as I understood it at least, all both players have the same, you know, like they agree on everything and they have the same perfect, you know, knowledge about everything, but um, it doesn't seem to me it seems contradictory to me to say that you can have a perspective while also having the same attitudes if those might reduce the value of the variable that drove the first person's perspective, if that makes sense. It does make sense. So, and I think, so this, this is a great question. I think what it hits on, so it's actually not quite capturing what's really going in, on in the model because what's really going on in the model is not quite what, for at least how searching, really makes sense. Like, mm -hmm. What you're talking about actually makes better sense for, yeah. for searching for a house, but it's not actually what we did here because this isn't really a great model for searching for a house, mm -hmm. which I realized. So it's not the best illustrative example. So why is it not? Because even though I have the square footage perspective, like so you can imagine that like, if we have a whiteboard here, we say like the goodness of a house is some function of all these variables. Yeah. And it's key that Georgia and I have the same function. So even though I'm using square footage to guide my search and she's using lot size or whatever, the um, when we switch to her perspective, the that, that doesn't have any effect on the value of the house. It just affects which houses I consider to be similar to that house, which is why, like, in all these kind of like, like carried away um, like slide transitions, see they only move horizontally. Mm -hmm. In other words, like this like blue mm -hmm. house is like the same, right? It always okay. has the same fitness, no matter how we arrange them. It never. Now, so, so what that accomplishes, right, is that when we sort of switch over to my perspective. And, and start up here, it's not like that now this house is bad because I'm using square footage to drive mm -hmm. it. Because how good it is is partially determined by square footage. It was determined by square footage for her as well. She just didn't use that to, to go figure right. out which house to look at. Now, in reality, though, like I think it's true that, well, first of all, different people have different valuation functions. But also, what kind of, what that gets at a little bit, that is a problem with this example is that like, you know, I should sort of have not only an idea of like which houses are similar, but I also probably have some idea in my head of like how this particular variable affects the goodness of the house, independently of just like testing out two houses and saying, oh wow, it's getting better, mm -hmm. right? You know, I don't just say like, oh, I went to a little bit bigger house, it's getting better, let me go to another house that's a little bit bigger and keep going. Like I should be aware of the fact that I want a house that's bigger or smaller, and all these other variables. Um, the example works. That problem with the example gets a lot better when you have more than 
Because in reality, like I don't just use square footage, right? Like, yeah, I, I look at like five or six. I get, <laughs> I'm pretty simple-minded, but I like to have at least get a hold in my head like three or four variables at once. But, yeah. Have you thought about how error in other you know, others' estimations influence that? Can it be modeled it? Uh, yes and no. So t totally, I mean, one of the like kind of checks I think that we need to do on this is to say, what if? Yeah, so there could be two different kinds of error. One could be error in perception of how good a solution is. The other could be that like I'm willing to make mistakes occasionally, like I'm willing to test out a solution that's worse than the solution I'm already at. We have looked at that um, in some other, so this is only one problem that we're considering. Um, we're also looking at like changing the network of problem solvers and stuff. So we've looked at that in other contexts, but not for this particular problem yet, but I think we really should because, you know, if you ramp, one of the big problem within sequence searching is that we're at the slope of them and you can't sort of go back down and come back up, and then it could be that if we ramped up enough error um, in sequence would be, would be better. Um, which is kind of interesting because it's like easy problems, but for which you're willing to make mistakes, somehow is it good. You think, you think if you ramp up error, sequence would be better than parallel? Right. Because sequence almost by definition implies that you're inferring something from someone else and trusting their solution to go with. So if I've been given a bad solution, I can only get so much, I can only make that so much better. But if I've been given a good solution, I can make that a lot better, potentially. Well. It's like rewriting your graduate student's papers. <laughs> well, I mean, the thing is that actually, when you can't make any error, when you can't, when you can't, oh, don't allow yourself to search down getting a really good solution to start with is really limiting. Because you're so high, you probably don't know any other adjacent solutions that are better than it. But if you sort of allow yourself to either make errors or to, to say like, well, I'm, I'm willing to kind of get worse for a little while before I get better, then if I start out at a good solution, I'm not so limited. So it may be the case that being able to make errors. I guess I'm thinking uh, that, that's another way of making errors and that you're going down absolutely lower fitness, but I guess I'm thinking of really the perception of that I'm going to start with this one that I'm, of, of the choices oh, yeah, that yeah, I'm yeah. connected to, I'm going to start with that one because I'm assuming that's the highest, but that in fact could be Not, yeah. a, an incorrect assumption, in which case you're sort of starting off on something that really is lower than you perceive it to be. And that in cases where in these sort of social dynamics cases, it seems that could be a real issue. Yeah. Um, I mean, so the we should, of social learning. We you know, should try. We should try. The wrong thing. Yeah. We should try it, and I, but I still think actually, and for the reason that why this is like typically you're right in social learning. Like if a person makes an error and then you copy off of them, that's bad. So you would want them to not make errors. But the thing is that here sort of copying off some, a good solution is actually bad for you in this case, in, right? Because it limits your ability to go. So you actually, it might be better if people are making errors and you copy off of them because now you're actually, you're sort of not paying the cost of having a, it's actually a, sort of like a problem almost to have a too good of solution to begin with. Right, I can see that too. So sort of blatant, obvious way, but another way to break it is if there's a cost for each step, right? Yes, if yes. Research and development cost, then in that case it's a lot better to do a sequence just because you don't have to do some steps. Yeah, so if you limit yourself, exactly, right? So you, one, you could just say, okay, we only have X number of steps, and then, yes, absolutely. That's and, and then from a fitness point of view, so in your case is the best because there might be a thousand different agents out there and you pick the best one. But if I only care about myself and finding my best one, it might be better to copy someone else. Even though I'm not as optimal, I have less risk of doing it before. Yes, yes, exactly. So it depends on, right, if we're thinking about, I'm the firm and I can control all this, and I'm just going to do the best, but I don't care how well my individual employees do. Yeah, but you're absolutely right. If I'm one of these agents, it may be better off for me to, um, to just go ahead. Start off at the That's true. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to bring some of the threads of the discussion together. And so correct me if I'm going off at a tangent, but it seems to me that the, the, 
there are analogies between um, natural selection solving problems um, across taxa, right, where you'll get potentially very divergent solutions to, say, flight or photoreception or whatever it is, right? Um, uh, and within a species or even um, a, a population and lineages. So you, you can think about lineages as solving the problem in sequence and that they have the same kind of path dependence um, that your in sequence problem solving in the model has. Yeah. Um, and they can be stuck at lo local optima that are not um, uh, the overall optima because um, they're, they can only move forward from where they are right now. Right. right? Um, but if the experiment is run across the, the total possibility state space to start with, then you end up with a cephalopod eye that's better than a vertebrate eye or something like that. Yeah. So this, this gets at this question of the, the cost to the individual versus the, the optimization across the system, right? In the sense that um, from the individual's perspective, it's often going to be the case that in sequence solving is, I mean, obviously in the case of, say, selection within a lineage, you have no choice, right? But um, it is still going to be the case that from the lineage perspective, that's the best solution, right? Because it can't explore the full possibility space. So that suggests that if you're setting up your firm, for example, right, if you want to have the parallel process solution, you have to reward failed efforts, that's right? right. You, you can't promote the people who hit the, 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 the highest optimum. Right? Otherwise, you're disincentivizing um, uh, the performance in parallel. Yeah. Uh, and similarly, it suggests you know, that, for example, if you're looking for new antibiotics, right, that your best solution is not to look at, um, since most antibiotics um, are naturally occurring in, as a consequence of the, the competition between species, your best solution is not to look at species producing something related to what you already have. It's to look at a completely different ecology or across a completely different taxa, right? Um, because that might be a higher solution than what you have right now. And, and you don't care about the, the, the welfare of the individuals involved. Yeah, I mean, on that last point, I agree with everything you said. Possibly on the last point, you have the issue of like, you could think of the firm as, I mean, if they have a limited number of tries, places they could look, like, um, it's expensive to incentivize parallel process. Yeah, you still have I mean, to, right. So Google can afford to do it, right, where they, they, they give their employees <coughs> nice. free time to work on whatever they want, but that's because they're fabulously wealthy, right, if you're a small firm. You yeah. might not be able to do that, right? And you actually want to differentiate between people who, who get on better solutions and people who get on worse ones. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thanks. So I, I have a kind of semi roundabout comment slash question about um, the evolutionary psychology angle on this. So um, one of the questions in the human literature on search is how, because different search strategies um, will be better or worse depending on how the environment is structured. As you had in your, you had the, the graphs structured in a particular way, right? Yeah. Um, and then there's this interesting question, like how do people or animals know what kind of environment they're in, and is there any kind of psychology that says use this strategy for this environment, use that strategy for that environment? Um, coincidentally, I was just reading a paper this morning on the explore exploit uh, trade-off, where they gave people a bunch of different tasks, and there's a metric you can use to measure sort of how exploration-oriented someone is. Um, and what they found is that it didn't correlate within individuals across different tasks. Oh, cool. Hmm. But, but there was, they gave people, you know, if you can sort of categorize tasks into types, they gave multiple versions of each type, and people were consistent within, right, exactly the, the categories, but across categories that had very different sort of exploration levels. And it, and it, and it was, the connection I was thinking was, you know, do, well, first of all, do people come with some sort of priors about, there's some sort of cue that they can use to say, I'm going to use this kind of strategy because I'm in this kind of environment. Maybe maybe where there's a smooth upward mm -hmm. slope instead of rough or something like that. But it, 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 it also might be a reason why the people do better on the folding task than the computer do if 
they come with some kind of intuition that says, you know, yeah. this is the, this is the problem structure. I, I should use this strategy, and, a, and, a, and an all-purpose algorithm might not come with that kind of intuition built in. Yeah. I don't know. That's not exactly a question, but I was curious if you have a, a, a thoughts about like where the psychology, you know, if there might be different things in our psychology that, that, that tell us to use like sequential versus parallel in certain situations. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I think that, so that's one of the things we've thought about when we're thinking about like running an experiment to follow up on this. Like we thought about two different things. One is just to test the prediction where we have some tasks that we can like make harder and then we have people work in sequence and in parallel and see, okay, well, they do better for easy tasks, they do better in sequence and hard tasks, they do better in parallel. But we'd also like to say, what if you could choose? And do they, as you make the task harder, do they choose to do the one that they should do or not? I have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we see that at least in some cases, like, some, whether or not they're doing it um, with this, like, in mind, like, the Google thing is like a firm kind of saying, let's do this like in parallel thing, or some of these like crowdsourcing competitions are saying like, here's a hard problem, let's do it in parallel, or NASA with this engineering challenge. So sometimes people are doing it, but we don't know. So I don't know. <laughs> That's a cool question to think about. Yeah. Since you say we're thinking about systems to look at this in, I mean, social insects. Like looking at it, there you have both the parallel and kind of the sequence rule because you have individuals. So say they want to search for any food, you have the explorers that are scouts that go and look for the food, and then you have the exploiters that come and actually dig up the resource. So you have kind of both things happening, um, kind of at different levels, and potentially depending on how the environment is. Like if it's bees in the Arctic, where every there's flowers everywhere, they might not need so much exploration, but if they're in the field with variable resources that come and go, and then you might be more exposed to exploration, and then you have both the interest of the colony as a whole is in everything like unified, more or less. Yeah. Um, so you can have like different ratios of when more exploration, when more sequence, and so on. What are the systems to think about? No, yeah, that's a good, <coughs> that's a cool example. We have, so, so we have some other like different we're, we kind of take the same framework of people having perspectives given by networks and apply it in a lot of different other questions. And one like example we tried, we've been thinking about is where, um, so the the points are in a space again, like in that, um, in this this one. And then we have some people whose network has like a much higher probability of being the points that are really close, and some people have a network that's are points that are far. So it's kind of like you've got the explorer ants and the refiner. We call them refiners and explorers, I think. And then we put them in different networks and we see like, okay, is it better? Like, do you need, is, is it kind of like not surprising that you want to have some of both because, you know, explorers can sort of, they get to something and then they just go somewhere totally different, but you need somebody to kind of, once you get, I mean, if you, it's really easy to see on the surface, they're like, once you get here, you want somebody who can take like little bitty steps to like finish it off, um, and yeah. But we haven't thought about the particular. I mean, there might be some good data or something else you need to look for. Okay. Yeah. Forgive me if I'm uh, if I'm greatly misunderstanding something, but if we're assigning a fitness value to any point in the network but you're sitting at that point and you get free information about all connected points and a free move to all the connected points. Are we really only getting like a portion of the fitness value? Because if you get the free information and the free move, isn't the fitness value like the maximum of any available move to you? Or conversely, doesn't that information have value itself that isn't being accounted for in the fitness value? Oh, yes. So, yeah, uh, absolutely. So, if I understand what you're saying, right, like, like the the value of moving to a certain solution is also dependent on how good of other solutions it's connected to. Yeah, it, like right. it unlocks all of those other things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's that's absolutely true. And and so, if we think of 
right? And it, and there is so it's a different sort of definition of what maybe like fitness of the solution or value of the solution like is. Um, it's relative to the network. Right. So we're saying like if we're thinking about antibiotic drugs, we're calling like the value of the solution like just how many bacteria does it kill, or the value of a house as if I moved here, how good would it be? But you're right that inherent in this problem context, like there's additional value to actually just going and looking at one house because it actually informs to me, right, exactly what you said. Um, and yeah, we don't take that into account here at all. That basically lets you go down into the valleys, right? Exactly, right, yeah, right. That's right. There'd be a value to you. Like a, a, house, that, a house that's bad could have good value because it could lead to a <coughs> of attraction. For sure, yeah. So um, Clark and I often see the world in different but sometimes complementary ways. And if I understood his, his question or comment, he was suggesting that, that people had uh, evolved cues, or the, ability, uh, the evolved ability to use cues as to the nature of the problem space that would lead them, um, depending on the fit between the problem and the adaptation that they have that would lead them to better or worse solutions. That seems like a plausible idea to me, but uh, another way of approaching this, you know, what do people actually do um, question is that there's probably variation across individuals and across cultures that would lead to preferences for parallel or in sequence, right? So if you think about across individuals, um, somebody who's extremely self-confident um, might prefer the to be part of an in parallel competition, mm -hmm. right? Because they say, well, I'm I'm pretty certain that I can arrive at, at, at a higher optima than most of my um, you know competitors in the firm or whatever, yeah, yeah. right? Um, but somebody who is less self confident might find differences across gender, right? As or a, risk averse, right? Or risk averse, same thing, right? Might say, no, 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 I would prefer to stand on the shoulders of others, right? Um, because I'm likely to get farther that way than if I venture out on my own. Yeah. Similarly, you might get differences, say east-west differences, for example, um, where you know the highly individualistic cultures might be more consistent with an in parallel competition style solution, and the more communal, um, you know, uh, collectivist societies might be people to prefer an in sequence solution. So you can, I mean, conceivably. Were you to run laboratory experiments on this, right, and we can imagine sort of toy examples where you could, uh, yeah. you know, origami folding and things like this, right? Um, uh, um, uh, uh, you could you could run it and see. It would certainly be worth collecting a bunch of the individual difference variables, both personality and cultural, because if you give people the option about what strategy to pursue, um, you would want to know whether they're doing it because of the the cues as to the nature of the problem, or whether they're doing it for reasons that are separate from that, that have to do with their general strategies yeah. about social interaction and problem solving. Right? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good thank you. Remi that reminded me also of another example I had, which is just like, I, ha I had some friends who were ER doctors, and just over beers I was like telling them about this, and they <coughs> said that, so they, they do both of these things, like as actual doctors, and they, ha they first of all have no guidance whatsoever about what to do. There's nothing like in medical school that says do A or B. But that they, um, but roughly their intuition of what to do sort of follows this, right? They, they will bring in another doctor and, and, and not say anything if it's a case where they feel like they don't really know very well what's going on. They don't understand the situation very well, but if they, do understand it, then they'll, they'll tell them exactly where they're at and say, okay, you know what, I sort of can't close the, close the deal here. What do you think I should do from here? That was just two doctors. <laughs> so. But I bet, for example, surgeons are probably more likely to prefer <laughs> parallel. Right? Internists are probably more in, in sequence, right? Because the personality type that it takes to be a successful surgeon is different than the personality type that it takes to be a successful surgeon. Yeah, yeah. These were in parallel types, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thanks a lot.